Good day. I'm Dan Assard. I'm the managing partner of the Foresight Companies, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. If you missed something or want to hear any of this webinar again, it's being recorded, and we expect it to be available on our website as early as tomorrow. You know, when COVID hit, I challenged Chris Kruger, my partner and our chief operating officer to make sure that when we came out of this self-isolation from this pandemic, to make certain that we as a consulting firm were viewed stronger in the eyes of the profession that we serve. Chris came up with and championed the creation of this study that we're going to be sharing with you today. We realized that the pandemic changed everything. What we didn't know is to what degree things changed and to what degree there would be elasticity in those changes. In other words, what will go back and what will never go back to the way it was. We were interested in understanding the potential role that COVID-19 as a crisis has played to reshape our sociological lives and how consumers interact with the funeral and cemetery service providers. So we're here today to discuss with you the findings of a study that we commissioned with SoCal Marketing Group. It was headed up by Chris in the middle of April. He was supported by my other partner, Doug Gober, our Director of Business Development, Gabe No, Director of Business Analyst, Stephanie Ramsey, Director of Operations, Catherine Bellavo, and our Marketing Manager, Nicole Vulo. In this webinar, as we present our findings to you, you as the attendee are gonna be on mute, but we expect you're gonna have questions. We encourage you to learn that you can submit a question to us by moving your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom screen, and there's a question box there. We'll take questions uh, in our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. At the end of the Q&A, as we sign off the webinar, we'll be sending you a survey to complete only seven questions. And from that, we'll also send you a handout of all of the slides. I do want you to know about SoCal. SoCal uh, is the company that we partnered with to perform this survey. SoCal Marketing and Consulting Group is led by George Owens, who you're going to be hearing from today. His partners, Oren Rappaport and Mike Cooperman, they're out of the Los Angeles area. They were founded, in their words, to help clients open their aperture in ways that they may not have thought possible. They and their team are all originally through the J.D. Powers world, and George, in addition, spent 13 years with a little company named SCI as the number two marketing person. I'll have their contact information on a handout for you. And obviously to say that they have the breadth and depth of experience in the world of research and funeral service is an understatement. Today, you're gonna to be hearing from several people. Doug Gober, my partner, began his funeral service career 40 years ago. I think he sold the casket to uh, Mary Todd Lee Lincoln for the service. He's earned numerous national awards in various organizations within the funeral and cemetery worlds. During his time at the duty group, Matthews International, Doug pioneered the development of the York marketing systems. Since then, he worked with Carriage Services, Live Oak Bank, created his own lending service company before several years ago, merging with Foresight. George is the founder of, and principal consultant for SoCal Marketing. He has over 25 years experience in high performance environments. Prior to that, George, as I said, worked with JD Powers and SCI. Chris Kruger 
if you don't know Chris, began his career in funeral service almost 25 years ago, starting as a young financial analyst in corporate development for SCI, where he ultimately spent 13 years. Chris quickly rose through the ranks and up the ladder of SCI to ultimately being their vice president of business development, responsible for corporate development, real estate, construction, and affiliate relationships. Now the key to any seminar is the, the key to any survey is the methodology. In crafting this methodology with George and his partners, we basically established that we wanted seminar, uh, I'm sorry, survey responses from people that were residents of the United States, at least 45 years old, had a minimum income of $35,000 a year. The only thing that we really tried to change in the uh, assimilation of this data was we wanted the uh, gender mix to be 60% female, 40% male, because as we all know, in funeral or in the cemetery world, women make the majority of the decisions. The respondents were contacted by an online solicitation and they were asked to provide their insights and understanding into the individual attitudes and perceptions about funeral and cemetery profession. When we did this survey, we expected it to take about six to seven days to collect more than 2,500 impressions. We got them within two days. The average survey took over 12 minutes so the respondents really cooperated and had a lot to tell us. Based upon this, we're dealing with a 95% reliability on our conclusions. The survey was done on May 1st and May 2nd. And those dates are very, very important because our objective was to study the attitudes of consumers specifically as to their use and desires of funeral homes and cemeteries prior to COVID-19 pandemic, how they changed during the self-isolation when we could not gather, when we could not do things as had been in the past. And the key thing to May 1st and 2nd is this is a time when we were just about to see what we thought was the end of this isolation, a returning to a new normal. So we asked people the same questions as it pertained to what they would have done pre-COVID-19, during the isolation, and what they expect to be doing after. In a moment, I'm going to turn over the uh, survey, uh, the seminar to Chris. But first, I'm going to share a video with you. Our press release was picked up by more than 100 media outlets, and CNBC wanted to take the lead and created this video. They aired it on May 27th, and it highlighted some of the high-level fundings. The results are captivating. Please watch this video. And then God's love and comfort right now. Planning a funeral can be difficult enough, but imagine doing it in a pandemic. The coronavirus has forced the $20 billion a year death industry into the digital age. We've gone from an industry uh, that, as I say, is very steeped in tradition, very slow to change, to really, you know, gone from one extreme to the other. Government shutdowns have limited many funerals to only 10 people, including funeral home staff, and that has cut into revenues. So funeral companies have scrambled to invest in things like live streaming. Jay Dodds manages one of the largest companies in North America, Parklawn, and is president of the International Cemetery Cremation and Funeral Association. He says funeral directors are learning to be creative. We've been doing drive-by funerals. We had a young man that passed away and the family really wanted to have a service. So we did a setup in our parking lot and over 200 cars drove by and, and paid their respects. It's things that two months ago we would have thought, well, that we would never do that. 
Customer expectations are also changing. A survey by the Foresight Companies, which consults to the funeral industry, found that 40% of people expect live streaming to continue to be part of the industry, as increasingly fewer people feel the need to actually attend a funeral in person. The biggest change, however, has been putting pricing and planning funerals online. Unheard of before, but 75% of the people surveyed said they expect it. And actually, 53% of the people are telling us that they won't do business with, the, with businesses that don't give them that level of transparency. We've always hesitated of putting them online because we're also mandated by the Federal Trade Commission to itemize our prices. So our price lists are pretty complicated. But Dodds expects that too will change. There's going to need to be more transparency from an online uh, perspective. Not everything has changed. Demand for cremations has stayed about the same, and many people who've lost loved ones are still planning to eventually have memorial services. And every day, funeral workers are still going into homes and hospitals doing their jobs, even in a pandemic, calling themselves final responders. Jane Wells, CNBC Business News, Los Angeles. I'm sending you... First of all, I'd like to, uh, Dan mentioned uh, the SoCal approach um, in his opening remarks. I would like to uh, highlight what uh, Oren, uh, Mike, and George have done because the, uh, their expertise, not only are they some of the finest human beings that I've ever met, uh, the work that, and the time that they have put into this study and the learnings in its first of its kind have given us a, an entirely new perspective on the consumer's attitudes for this industry that really didn't exist before. So I first would like to thank them. Um, <clears throat> the first point that I would like to make clear is that the data in no way suggests that the, this is the death of the cemetery, uh, funeral and cemetery industry. It is quite the contrary. Change does not mean the end. It simply means it's time to adjust. Let's also be clear that these are not opinions, nor are they assumptions. We're going to present you with actual data from a statistically accurate sampling of the U.S. population. We asked 2,548 consumers 115 questions. We collected almost 300,000 data points, actually 293,000. Uh, the methodology gives us a 95% degree of certainty, plus or minus a 2% uh, margin of error. That gives us data and empirical evidence and facts about the consumer's behavior that have never existed before. Now, what the, what the Foresight Company's 2020 U.S. Consumer Behavior Study concludes is that the pandemic has fundamentally altered how the funeral industry will need to operate in the future if it hopes to succeed in the post-pandemic world. The three most profound findings are around technology, physical attendance, and price transparency. Now these three areas of our industry have undergone a radical shift and the consumer is telling us that they do not, nor will they accept them going back to the way they used to be. Now the implication of these findings will affect three significant operational areas of the way the industry operates today. Technology. As we outline the findings, you will see where technology is at the center of many of the expectations of the consumer going forward. Human resources. <clears throat> As is often the case uh, with change, the right people, the number of, and the skill set of the different people is going to be different in the post-pandemic world. And lastly, the physical plant or the facilities in general will have a different look in the post pandemic world. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's coming. And it's certainly something that we cannot ignore. Funeral homes and cemeteries need to adapt. Some of the most telling things we learned is that while the consumer has a different level of expectations, they are not necessarily going to be willing or expect to pay for these products. This has a significant implication on how you are pricing your goods and services. Now we'll discuss that while the consumers are not necessarily expecting to pay less for their funeral services, they are placing a whole lot less importance on the material items as a means of showing how much they care. Now my partner has long, Mr. Assard has long been a champion 
for placing the emphasis more on you than on the materials. And what the consumer is telling us is they're telling us the exact same thing. The industry is far from in tatters, but there most certainly will be winners and there's going to be losers. There's one of my favorite quotes is from Warren Buffett, when the tide recedes, we'll soon see who's been swimming naked. Now, we have some false hope right now in the form of stimulus and other government uh, assistance, but the change to the funeral and cemetery uh, industry is here to stay. Generally, the industry is probably 20 years behind the times. Sure, we've got technology, we've got transparency, and other current concepts creeping into our business, but it is nowhere near, nowhere near where it needs to be. It's nowhere near where it is almost in every other facet of our lives today. In simple terms, the consumer is telling us that if we are not transparent in what we do and embrace technology, they're gonna look elsewhere. Now, this is not a death sentence. It is rather a prescription. All we have to do is listen to what the consumer is telling us. We're not reinventing the wheel. These are, these are technologies and these are concepts that are out there. We have to embrace them. This is gonna include a different role for the funeral director and that of the cemetery counselor going forward. This is where the implication of human resource deployment really becomes important. In the pre-pandemic world, the idea of making funeral arrangements virtually was almost unheard of. In the current environment, well, over the last several uh, months, it has been commonplace. In the post-pandemic world, the consumer is expecting this convenience. The consumer is telling us that they would choose to make their funeral and cemetery arrangements virtually. They're not telling us that they want to fill out a form online. They're simply expressing a choice for convenience. This does not mean that people are looking to remove the personal interaction it's just simply saying how they want to interact with these professionals going forward. As we gradually work ourselves into this new normal that Dan was talking about, there is a natural aversion to large gatherings. Jay said it in the CNBC piece, there are those who are going to want what they can't have. We saw it during Memorial Day, we've seen it at the beach. We've seen it, we're seeing it with professional sports, festivals, um, and just about every other event we have out there. When will we be returning to normal? What will that normal look like? Most of our own state and national conventions have either been postponed or canceled. Obviously, our industry is on a totally different parallel than some of these things I just mentioned. But we see that attending services virtually and that there's being a, there's a significant shift in the social dynamic. Now, while the consumer aversion to large gatherings may have shifted, it does not mean that we don't want a large celebration. The way we celebrate might be slightly different. Now, the importance of the large celebration has declined slightly, from 68% pre-pandemic to 60% post-pandemic. The consumer is simply saying that there are different ways that they want to celebrate going forward. Now, going back about six weeks ago when we were developing this survey, uh, one of the things that we looked at was how does the NFDA uh, look at emerging trends? One was making funerals more personal and meaningful, advanced funeral planning, pre-need, cremations on the rise, meeting consumer needs through technology, green funerals, the new face of the profession, more women entering our profession than men. We'll touch on each of these as we move through the learnings, but in some cases what we learned uh, was as much about what we didn't see as, as what we did see as the results from the uh, pandemic. <clears throat> the earliest surprise, what we didn't see. There was no measurable impact on the propensity of the consumer to select cremation as a means of disposition. Now, depending upon your source, um, cremation rate is somewhere between 52 to 56 percent. I think Kena has it at 55 percent last year. Now, in the early days of the pandemic, I was certainly expecting to see a spike in cremation, uh, maybe a three to five year jump, something uh, the national average spiking north of 60%. Well, the data came back and it showed only a 2% shift, relatively unchanged. In dozens of conversations that we had with operators around the countries, big and small, 
they were experiencing something similar. There may have been more direct burials and more direct cremations, but there was no meaningful shift in the means of disposition from burials to cremations. Now, quite possibly, one of the most profound learnings from this study is that the consumers absolutely expect and want access to funeral and cemetery prices online. 75% strong want that information, 75%. Now that demographic skews slightly more female than male, but it is still three out of every four people are looking for pricing to be available online. Now Jay mentioned in the CNBC piece that we have some pretty complicated GPLs. Now for the most part, the FTC has made it that way. You know, one of the coolest thing that's happened from this uh, study is when we brought this information to uh, Park One and to Jay, uh, they already had about half of their um, GPLs available online. Upon seeing this information, Jay had indicated that almost overnight, they were gonna put all of their price lists online. And not only were they gonna put them online, but they were gonna call it transparency. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, there's an Albert Einstein quote, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it. Now we're gonna to have to make our pricing easier for the consumer to understand and they wanna see it. Now, equally, if not more powerful, 52% of consumers have indicated that they will not do business with firms that do not make their prices available online, 52%. If we take 52% of the approximate 2.4 million deaths in the United States, that means that 1,248,000 client families are simply saying that they will choose not to do business with you if you do not make it easy for them. How would reducing the call volume of any firm affect the bottom line if 50% of the calls went away like that? Heck, what if 25% of the, of the calls went away? Now, the sampling here tells us that the men feel a little bit more strongly about this than the women, but the numbers are huge, 52%. This is one area where the consumer's inclination is very clear. If you do not do this, we will not work with you. We will work with somebody else. The question was, it will be appropriate to make funeral arrangements with a funeral director over the phone or virtually when a loved one passes. 46% of consumers have said this is how they would like to make arrangements with a funeral director or a cemetery counselor. That is 46% of the total consumer base wants to make arrangements virtually. Pre-pandemic, that number was closer to a third or 34%. Not that we were doing it then. But the same population, 68% of the group that wishes to make their arrangements virtually are the same ones who are saying they will not do businesses, do business with companies that are not showing their prices online. Now, interestingly, this group skews a little bit younger, not surprisingly, but they're also inclined to spend more. This group is telling us <clears throat> that they clearly want transparency, they want convenience, and they're willing to pay for it. They still want to interact with a person, but they want to do it on their terms. Probably the lowest hanging fruit and the most immediate impact to business. Here's another one of those emerging trends that has taken a far more heightened uh, awareness and perhaps even far more amplified because of the times. Pre-need, almost 75% of all consumers 73% on the funeral side, 74% on the cemetery feel that pre-planning their needs is important. On the pre-need side, this pandemic has first far more importance on pre-planning of services. The number increased by 26% on the funeral side and 19% on the cemetery side. These are the same people that are inclined to make arrangements virtually. They spend in the middle of the road and they're also less likely to do business if you're not transparent with the pricing. Now, as almost as interesting to me was that in addition to the 73% on the funeral side who feel strongly about prearranging, 19% of the population or the consumers say they're not predisposed in one direction or the other. So it means that only 7 or 8% feel that it is inappropriate 
to prearrange their funeral site. It's even higher uh, on the cemetery side. So think about practical terms. If you look at relevant population, call it 45 years and above in the US today, that's roughly 120 million people. The target population is 120 million people. Three out of every four are saying they're inclined to prearrange. From what we know, only 20 to 25% of those are, 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 have been arranged today. That means that one out of five, one out of four opportunities have actually been converted. If you don't focus on the consumer and give them what they're asking for, somebody else will. Now, needless to say, we have been spending a, just a colossal amount of energy on, identi on identifying these consumers and how do we reach them and how does it differenti differentially um, move the needle for some of our clients. We started a couple of engagements in this area and frankly, it's one of the, um, what I say, the, the, probably the biggest uh, quick wins that we've identified. Uh, George, I'm going to pass this to you, and uh, maybe you can comment on this as well as um, the green options. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. You know, a 20 percent, uh, 20 percentage point increase in terms of uh, roughly in terms of people saying they're interested in planning is significant, as Chris mentioned. The other thing I wanted to mention uh, is the concept around green options. We had a question where we wanted to uh, get an understanding in terms of folks demonstrated interest in green. Not a new topic for the funeral and cemetery industry, but certainly something that we wanted to make sure we put our fingers on as well. And again, we see an interest in green options, certainly on uh, the green burial side, 17% of consumers stating they want green options. But interestingly, we still see a very large disconnect between those folks saying they want and are interested in it, and those that are actually willing to pay for green burial options at only 7% of the total. So while there's still interest in these trends, um, there is not a demonstrated willingness uh, in a significant way uh, to, to pay for those services. So that'll continue to be, I think, an education uh, opportunity for funeral and cemetery operators in terms of explaining what these processes and what these potential products and services are, and then demonstrating a value in them so consumers are actually willing to purchase them. Thanks, George. <clears throat> now next, the consumer has a totally new level of expectations from the funeral home. 40% of consumers expect live streaming services to be available at the funeral home. Doug? Chris, before I uh, begin my comments, let me encourage everyone by uh, submitting your questions to us through the Q&A icon at the, at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar, and we'll be getting to those shortly. Uh, many of you, as it relates to this particular slide and, and the topics that we're discussing, have heard me refer to the idea of funeral guest through the years. Uh, those are the people walking in your front door for an event with little grief who are open to your message through their observations while they're in your building. Uh, this significant acceptance that you're seeing uh, represented here of live streaming funerals is not just the next evolution in funeral broadcasting, but it's really the next evolution in funeral attendance. It redefines funeral guests and how you communicate your message with them. Uh, it also radically changes how we define competition. Your competitor is no longer just a guy down the street or in your county. Uh, virtually, your competitor more than ever before is potentially any funeral home anywhere. A funeral prospect is now seeing what others in funeral service nationwide are doing from their office or their home as they attend a funeral as a virtual guest. And it broadly opens up their exposure. As noted on this slide, the 79% who are unwilling to pay extra for it clearly implies that they expect it to be table stakes a part of your standard offer. 
If you don't currently offer live streaming or you think you can charge for it, you won't even get in the game. And as we go forward, Chris is going to elaborate a little more on this, but I just uh, specifically wanted to make a comment about this slide. Chris? Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I think the point is, you know, four in 10 people that are walking through your door today are expecting live streaming uh, to be provided. And only 21% are willing to pay for it. I mean, you, you, you look at, I think it was uh, SCI in their first quarter earnings release had mentioned that they now had Facebook Live available in 1,000 of their locations. You know, in practical terms, we have a significant consumer demand what is, what is by, beyond what is being offered today. Now, the operating model is critical. You have to be pricing your goods and services properly or you're going to get burned. You know, in this slide we see, it's interesting to note that it is more widely accepted in the Southern United States and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the least, uh, the least uh, prominent region, if you will, is the Rocky Mountain area. But think about this. Four out of 10 people walking through your door are expecting it. So what if you were, I mean, if you've got 40% of the people walking into your location and they're expecting something and you're not even offering it, uh, where do you think that positions you? Now, here is where technology and physical attendance intersect. There is a 72% increase in the number of people that now believe they can show how much they care by simply attending a live streaming of a funeral. That number has increased by 72%. 43% of the consumers now feel they can show how much they care by simply attending a live streaming of a funeral. These are the same consumers, the same group that are expecting live streaming to be part of the standardized offering at a funeral and the cemeteries. The, rea the reality of impact, this impacts our human resources and our physical plan. We have to look closely at the size of our facilities, the investment in technology, and the people we're going to need for the interaction with the consumer of the future. This dramatically impacts the way we invest in our business and how we're training our people. Here we see another confirmation. People are gonna be less inclined to travel long distances to attend a funeral post pandemic. It doesn't suggest it's gonna to come to a screeching halt. It does say that people are 20% less inclined to jump on a plane. It also interrelates to the fact that 43% of consumers they feel that they can show how much they care simply by live streaming or signing a virtual register book. And this even for this drive drives home the point even more. Pre pandemic 42% of consumers felt strongly that attending a funeral was important. Post pandemic that number is 26%. That number has declined by 35%. Put this in perspective 43% now feel that they can show how much they care by attending a live live streaming. Post pandemic 26% say that it's important that I show up in person. 65% more people feel that they can show how much they care by live stream. That is a 35% decline in the number of people that may be attending your services going forward. Let's put that in perspective. You look at a 200 person uh, chapel service. If you had 70 people less show up to that service, how does that start to impact your requirements around parking? around attendance, people, prayer cards, chairs, coffee, et cetera. It affects every aspect of our business model. Now we have a ton of data around consumer spend. In broad strokes, about one in five see themselves spending in excess of $8,000 for a funeral service. The current NFDA average about 7,350. A quarter of consumers plan to spend more now or in the future than the national average. The industry is far from dying. This is not the apocalypse. What our industry does is valued and it is absolutely not going away. But the consumer is shifting the value proposition, plain and simple. 
Now, these statistics tell the, tell the story of the value proposition to the consumer. I do not need to spend a lot of money on the casket. Almost 50%, 44% strongly feel that they do not need to spend a lot of money on the casket to say that I care. That is a 33% increase to pre-pandemic numbers. It's a little bit less on the, on the flower side. One in four feel that they don't have to have a large display of, of flowers. A little bit less, but that number has doubled. It increased by 100% pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. The value proposition has changed. The consumer is telling us what's important. We just saw that people are, look, are, are not necessarily looking to spend less, but what they spend it on is gonna be different. It's the service, it's celebration, it's convenience, and it's transparency. We also have a ton of information around religion. Now we could slice it a million different ways, but simply put, the number of people who are observant and their, religious, their religion influencing their decisions has declined. The less observant the consumer, the more open they are to new ideas. Now, one of the things that we wanted to get a better feel for, for was how has our industry coming out of this pandemic, what is the perception of the industry? And what we found is that the more personal interaction that people have with our profession, the more positive uh, their experience. So when asked a question about professionalism, when asked about the profession as a whole, 81% has a positive impression on the industry, on the profession. When asked about a cemetery professional, that number increases to 88%. When asked about a funeral director who they've had an experience with, that number increases to 93%. So if I've interacted with a funeral professional or a cemetery counselor, my impressions are significantly higher about the individual than the profession. When asked the same question about honesty, when asked about the profession, 62% had a favorable opinion about, our, about the profession and its honesty. When asked about the cemetery professional, that number increases to 82%. When asked about the funeral director, it increases even slightly more to 84%. So generally speaking, if we have an opportunity to interact with the consumer, their impressions of the individual are more favorable to that of the industry. Now, coming out of this, obviously our industry as the final responders has had a tremendous amount of press. Most of it good, some of it not so good. However, 16% of consumers have a better impression of our industry coming out of the pandemic than they did before. It is a two to one relationship favorably of the impression of our industry coming out of this pandemic than it, did, than it, it was uh, going into it. So all of the hard work that our final responders have, have put in and all the creativity and the, uh, the quick thinking and the adapting has had a favorable um, impression on the consumer. So in summary, um, I want to go back and say, again, these are not our opinions, nor are they our assumptions. This is the actual statistical data to back this up. The three most profound findings that we have are around technology, about physical attendance, and about price transparency. And this is gonna affect every facet of our operating models and the way that we do business going forward. Technology, the way we market, the way we arrange, the way we plan, the way we celebrate, and the way we remember loved ones is going to, it has changed. Transparency, 75% of consumers are expecting us to make pricing easy for them. 52% are saying they will not do business with us if we don't make it simple for them. This has never been more important to solidify your brand identity than it is now. And lastly, physical attendance. You know, we've graduated to a world where 65% more people think that they can pay their respects and that attending a service virtually is just as important as doing it uh, in person. So it is a different world. Each one of these things, whether it be pre-need, whether it's technology, transparency, or physical attendance affects our operating models and the operating model of today and tomorrow is dramatically different than it was two to three years ago. For that matter, two to three months ago. So with that, uh, Dan, I will turn this back over to you.
Thank you, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, remind you that as you have questions, please put them into the Q&A section. I'm taking some off of the chat section as well, and I will put them to our panel. So, uh, George, there's a, there's a question that comes up, I'm sure, to your world all the time, and that is the statistical ability to reach conclusions. So is 2,500 respondents at a national level enough to come to this level of confidence for these conclusions? That's a really great question. Uh, first of all, you know, in our experience doing uh, research in this category, we've always found, number one, that respondents, regardless of the type of study that we're doing, are interested in talking about their experience, their engagement with funeral and cemetery professionals. So um, that's something we've always had a lot of confidence in. When we set out to do this research, we were very pleased with the strong response we received and the fact that we have over 2,500 respondents. When you think about the fact that in our target market that we were looking for, people over age 45 at a $35,000 income, there's about 110 million Americans that meet that criteria. So having over 2,000 in excess of 2,500 respondents gives us a very strong degree of accuracy. It allows us to look at information geographically and at demographic levels with a high degree of confidence. And it allows us to be extremely confident in the stability and accuracy of our data from a statistical standpoint. Great question though. Doug, a question for you. Do funeral homes need to hire outside companies to produce uh, the videos and other uh, technology uh, productions? Uh, Dan, I'll answer that in, in two ways briefly. Number one is there are companies in funeral service that do an amazing job of uh, putting live streaming. Uh, just this past week, NFDA received in the last 10 days over a thousand applications for uh, live streaming applications uh, for the licensing for that. Uh, so I would tell you that there are companies out there that can assist in, in putting this together. There was a question that was asked about what if you're in an area where the, the access to good technology is not great. There's got to be some uh, technological wizard out there somewhere who could figure that out for you. But in addition to that, uh, this is not that difficult once it's in place. Uh, people are doing this from cell phones. And it's and it's coming across quite well. And there's if if that doesn't work, there's if none of those options work, there's probably a 13 year old down the street from your funeral home that can do this. And so, uh, so I think the the option for uh, getting people who know what they're doing is a good one. But uh, if you don't want to spend the money, or you're just in a position where you're not ready for that, then it can certainly be done with without uh, without a lot of professional help. But if you want to do it right, I'd suggest you go to one of the industry experts. For those of you that know Doug, you know that there is an over-under bet pool on how many Goberisms we'll get today. The score is now one Goberism. I think the over-under is at four, so please make sure you place your bets. Chris, a question for you, uh, or, or more or less a comment from one of the attendees. Uh, the statistic that X number of people are willing to prearrange is a good idea, but uh, the the attendee doesn't feel that people really stand behind that. That they ultimately don't uh, are not willing to carry through with this intention. Do you think COVID is changing all that? Well, I, I think COVID. We certainly have seen on the funeral side there is 20, a twenty six percent increase in the percentage of um, that are inclined to do so. I think one of the things that we've also seen from the data, and George could comment on this, is that the profile that we're seeing of the individual who is, um, it, it, it's expanding the profile far beyond what we've historically seen um, as the, the, the typical pre prearranged uh, client. Yeah, what I would add to that, Chris, thank you, is that, you know, this this consumer is younger. They are more used to uh, technology. So providing them an opportunity to be exposed to the value of planning, the value of protection and the offering, they might not have heard it. Um, and so we've got, an, we've got now a huge 
potential opportunity with a new younger consumer to get messages about planning uh, a funeral, planning cemetery for not only their, their parents, but for themselves at a much younger age. And those operators that take advantage of um, these perceptions now among this group of consumers, we think we'll have success with that. And, and I would remind the, the, uh, the viewer that attended uh, this question to us, I appreciate you doing that, but COVID changed things. People went from being perfectly healthy, planning trips, uh, to, to being dead within 14 days. That makes a change in your psyche. And therefore, uh, if this research is correct, and I have every reason to believe that it is, we're going to need to find new and modern ways for allowing people to prearrange and the online world is going to match that with the technology desire that people have. It's not going to be someone coming to your kitchen table anymore yeah. to sell pre-needs. Dan, I think that one of the key points to that is, is it's a different profile of a consumer. The way that they want to interact with the, with the counselor is different. And they're looking, they, they have a, a, it's a different needs-based consumer, a needs-based um, opportunity and a wants-based opportunity. Uh, that was probably not there in the same, to the same degree uh, four months ago. Yeah, That's one of our respondents said that, uh, uh, that you know, with pre-need, people have been agreeing that pre-need was a good idea for decades, but they just haven't been following through on it. I think maybe what we're seeing pre, post, and even during is that the circumstances we're in right now have given people one additional incentive at least to move forward on those things they've always said they should do. Yeah, and, and it's interesting when you go beyond our survey, if you look at the National Funeral Directors Association uh, consumer research that they do every year, one of the questions on pre-need is, uh, how do you define a pre-need? And it goes everything from telling a friend what I expect to have done to what we would classically define within this business as a written funded pre-arrangement. <clears throat> so the consumer is going to uh, help us the more we help them define what a pre-need is. Doug, a question uh, came up. What are some of the ways funeral homes can recover some or all the costs for the technology services? Well, I'm going to answer that very briefly, uh, Dan, uh, just to keep us moving along. I, I think it... Uh, I think the first thing I would answer is run it like a business, not a benevolent society. Uh, our hearts are so big in funeral service that sometimes we ignore the financial side of the business and we can no longer do that. And the way to recover this is to properly price. Uh, pricing based on consumer preference uh, has never been more important than it is now. And an evaluation of how you price your, your services and your products, the products are not going away, they're just not as highly preferenced as they once were. I think how you price this and how you propose this to the marketplace is gonna be critically important going down the road because it's very clear what the consumer places value on just based on what we've looked at so far. George, a question for you. Can you speak to the geography of the, uh, of the uh, parties that were surveyed? Where did the 2,500 come from? Uh, yes, since we randomly uh, selected our responses, they come from uh, all across the United States. We're represented, we're represented nationally. Uh, you know, for example, our largest population in the United States is found in California. Our largest number of respondents are found in California. So when you do a representative sample, um, it is uh, mirrors the overall population that we're looking at. So it's representative across the United States. And we can look at data at census regions, nine-way and four-way, uh, as well as by states. Chris, a question for you on the transparency of pricing. Uh, what's the best way to put general price lists online so that way a complicated matter like uh, Jay Dodds referred to in, in the CNBC piece, uh, can be made easy for families. Do you have ideas on that? 
Well, I think that's one of the areas that we've been uh, we've been working with a couple of piece, people recently. I mean, obviously, we're mandated to a certain degree by the FTC how we uh, provide price lists to the to the consumer. Um, but you know, one of the things is not only just providing the price and giving them access to this information; it's being able to provide enough information about your brand identity and who you are uh, beyond your general pricing. <clears throat> And Dan, I'll add one thing to that. There's nowhere that says that it has to say general price list. Why not position your pricing online different than your competitors might do it by calling it a reference guide and using pictures to represent what those words on a price list normally mean? Because, you know, our price list, the way the FTC requires them, is a little bit cumbersome for the average consumer to wade through and understand exactly what they're seeing. So putting it online gives us an opportunity to not only post the prices for a particular event, but also to show an example of what it looks like. And I would just add two things to, to that question. First of all, as complicated as the FTC has made our uh, itemization of the service fees, nothing's more complicated than the way airlines have priced themselves and if airlines with 17 different prices based upon demand pricing times what else you acquire uh, can figure out a way to get their prices online i'm sure funeral service can do it as well yeah if you want a good laugh today google if airlines sold paint that would give you the best laugh you've had today excellent uh the uh, George, I'm sorry, I just got distracted by this. Uh, George, did the uh, survey differentiate between uh, willingness of pre-planning versus pre-paying? Or was, did we just assume they understood uh, pre-arranging? We, uh, we described prearranging um, in detail, but we did not ask a specific separate question about paying. But the way we asked it was, uh, we felt clear enough so that they understood we weren't talking about just thoughts provided to a friend. Okay, uh, let, let me ask this question and have uh, each of us take a moment to answer it. I think it's a good wrap up question. By the way, if you did ask a question, we didn't get to it. We do have them. We will uh, send a electronic response for your question uh, with that. Uh, let's assume that a vaccine is discovered. I don't know how long, but it's an effective vaccine. How is the events that we've discovered, the effect of COVID going to play not only post pandemic, but post vaccine. George, let me start with you. Sure, you know, one of the things that we see, whether in this category and others, is that when technology has transformed process, has tr transformed service, we see a tipping point. And one of the things that we believe coming out of this is that life for, for all of us will never return exactly to what it was before. And whenever we get consumers and consumer attitudes shifting towards convenience and shifting towards a situation that they feel is better for them, the consumer themselves won't allow it to go back. So we feel whether a vaccine occurs, we feel whether we're able to all return to the beach or to uh, baseball and football stadiums uh, tomorrow or next week or next month, there still will be an underlying change in how we look at everything we purchased, every way we interacted, everything we've done coming out of this four month period of time. Um, and as Chris very eloquently said throughout the presentation, we don't see that any of what we saw as the death knell of the funeral or cemetery business. Those operators that understand, those professionals that understand the value in listening to their consumers, listening to their customers, will very naturally find that they're able to provide service more effectively and that um, they'll be able to continue to grow their share of business. Doug? 
Dan, I would just refer to one of our early slides. Anytime there's upheaval in any business, whether it's ours or any other business, there's always winners and losers. And uh, being able to adjust on the fly in, in, in ways that we've never had to adjust as quickly before has already been demonstrated by this profession. This profession has responded uh, along with the medical profession like no other during the course of this. And I think coming out of this, we need to continue to recognize that our response is gonna be important and that some of your colleagues are gonna uh, respond to this very positively. We think that there's never been a better time to be in funeral service than now. That people view you in a different light than maybe some of them did previously. And the more you can uh, sing your song and do all the things they're asking for, the more likely this is to be a positive outcome, vaccine or not. I think the vaccine may cause a few people to get more comfortable to attend. And if they're local, then it's their custom, they're likely to go back to that. But I don't think we're ever gonna see it go back to where it was, vaccine or not. Chris, let me give you the last word on this. I would say that, you know, vaccine or no vaccine, what this has really done to funeral service, you know, I made a statement before where give or take, where the, the industry as a whole is 20 years behind the times. All this has really done has been an accelerant. These aren't technologies that didn't exist. These aren't concepts that are brand new to the world. The industry has done an incredible job at adjusting and adjusting on the fly. And the consumer is simply embracing the technology that is around us today. And we have all been forced to accelerate to that point in time. So when it comes to attending services virtually, it comes to transparency, brand identity, all of these things, all it has really done is it's really been an accelerant. And whether we have a vaccine, God willing, in a, you know, a day or, or six months, uh, our industry has undertaken a significant shift. And the way that uh, we need to embrace the consumer, embrace technology, embrace transparency, and uh, the attitudes of the consumer is here to stay. The effects of the depression, the effects of 9-11, other major worldwide events obviously change all of us. And I think COVID-19, whether it exists for another day or some longer period of time, is going to affect all of our mindsets and as Doug said, this business is about winners and losers. Ladies and gentlemen, we've tried to give you a short understanding of the future. We believe very strongly this is accurate information. It comes from consumers. It's not opinions as Chris has repeated and George has repeated. So with that, uh, any questions that were not answered, we will do a post uh, answering for you. Uh, this recording will be available on our website tomorrow. Uh, you may have questions that come up after the fact. And on the screen now you have Chris's email address uh, and you can direct it to him uh, directly or uh, again back through our website. You will have a survey sent to you uh, this afternoon, and you will have a handout sent to you uh, after that. Uh, so you'll have everything that we have here. As Chris said, we have over 290,000 data points. We shared with you only about 30 of the absolute easy conclusions. If you have further questions or want us to do a deeper dive specifically for your company, please reach out to us. We're available to do that. I want to thank George and his team at SoCal, an amazing partnership. Uh, George, you went from being a stranger to our new best friend uh, in just a few weeks. So thank you for the amazing job you and your team have done uh, for the execution of the survey, as well as the interpretation of that. Uh, I want to say thank you to Amy Silva and Jay Dodds, who contributed to the CNBC video piece. I want to thank Nicole Vulo, our marketing manager, for producing today's seminar. Uh, please, if you have further questions, put them into the website before you sign off, and we will get them back to you.
Thank you very much for participating. Stay safe. Good day.